What's up, everyone? You're watching Big Ten Volley Talk. I'm your host, Emily Eamon, joined by Indiana head coach Steve Aird. Coach Aird, how are you doing? I'm great, Emily. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm um, really excited to have you on. So now that you've had a little bit of time to digest, I kind of want to break down the recent news that Big Ten fall sports were canceled and potentially moved to the spring. So I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on the state of Big Ten volleyball, the NCAA overall, going into the spring and what that might look like. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, th I think the first thing maybe to be transparent is I think the, the decision makers, I think we've got to allow them some grace. I know there's a lot of venom out there about uh, how people view the decision. I think it's a really tough call to make. Um, obviously, as a coach and as a player in any of the sports in the Big Ten, you're, you're passionate, you want to play. Um, you wanted the opportunity, especially coming off of the COVID deal where these kids have been working out in their bedrooms and um, so excited to get back uh, to a normal situation. So, you know, I think everyone was disappointed. Um, you know, my big thing has been just trying to talk to the team about perspective. You know, I think that uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, and we, we might get into this a little bit later, but in a lot of ways, um, it's unfortunate and it's short term. It's, a, it's a really disappointing. But on the macro, there's a lot to be uh, grateful for, and we try to focus on that. Yeah. So for your team specifically, uh, Libero, Bailey, Lebo, and outside Cameron Malloy announced they actually are opting out of the spring. So what do you kind of think about their decision, but not only them, for others around the country who might do the same? Yeah, I was obviously disappointed because they're great kids and really good volleyball players. And, um, you know, we've been here now as a staff just a couple of years, and they've been fantastic right the way through. So we're going to miss them. And, uh, and I totally understand that that's the decision that they wanted to make. Um, you know, I think it's just hard. I think it's hard because everyone wants certainty and there's so much unknown. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's a case by case basis for a lot of the athletes. And then um, for the younger kids that are looking, maybe just starting their careers, I think it's very different than seniors where, um, you know, Bailey's going to get into nursing school and she's got a great plan and and Cam could have played for a long time if she wanted to, but she's a really bright kid and a fun kid, and she's going to land on her feet. So, um, you know, I think for the most for the most part, coaches are are trying their best to do what we say we do, and that support the kids and um, do what we can to 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 have them focus on you know the next phase of their life. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's no you know what to do in a pandemic playbook like. There's no precedent set right now. Everyone's trying to figure it out. It's very fluid. But what happens now? So you guys are back to school really soon. I imagine mostly everyone's back on campus or practicing in the weight room. Um, what does the fall kind of look like without competition? Yeah, it looks like we're going to get the opportunity to train and work with the kids. I think we, we haven't figured out if it's going to be 20 hours, kind of that rule all the way through, or if they're going to scale it back to eight hours. Um, those are things that we're, we're certainly talking about. I think the NCAA, the Big Ten, uh, the administrations are meeting about to try to have conversations and, and figure out how things work. Um, but, you know, just being grateful for any time that we have together. Um, and, and we're really fortunate. I think, you know, it keeps coming back for me, especially over the last few months, it keeps coming back to these kids are around people who care about them a ton. Uh, they've got a roof, they've got food, they've got internet. Um, you know, they're around their teammates, they're around people. If they need something, they've got good people around to help them. Um, in so many ways, they're so fortunate, um, especially considering some of the macro problems this country's dealing with right now. How do you think your players specifically are kind of dealing with that uncertainty? Uh, I think, you know, the coaching cliche is to win the day, right? Wake up and have a really good day and then wake up again and, and win the day again. You know, how do you eat the elephant? It's kind of one bite at a time. It's We, we don't know when the season's going to go down. I know that a lot of really good people are working really hard on a plan for the spring. Um, I think there's a lot of really bright people in the country that are trying to put things together. And obviously everything is predicated on the virus and that'll dictate the timeline. Um, but if we have the opportunity to play in the spring, we, we want them to understand that every, every rep they're taking now, uh, their volleyball IQ getting better, taking care of their body is eventually going to pay off. And certainly for the younger kids who have multiple years left in their career, that's, a, that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Do you think there are any advantages to playing in the spring right now? There certainly is for my program. Um, we have eight freshmen, so this was our first full kind of recruiting class that we brought in. A really um, good recruiting class coming in. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're really proud of them, and they're great kids. Uh, I think, and, and you know because you played, you come in and you got two and a half weeks to kind of figure stuff out, learn systems and whatnot, and then you're playing. So the beauty of coaching young kids is sometimes they don't know what they don't know. They just play. Um, but the way I look at it now is we're going to have months to develop these players and get them ready. And hopefully our product, I think potentially the product for NCAA volleyball across the board might just be so much better 
uh, in the spring if we can find a, a, a good template to work with. But we're certainly excited. And um, I just love being around this group. They're great kids. They work hard. They care. Um, and, you know, I'm going to do my best to trust them to make good decisions. And then we're just going to train like crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like you said, it's, it's so hard coming in and, you know, practicing for two weeks, not really knowing anything. The speed of the game is just exponentially higher. You know, you right. go right in, you're practicing, you're still like learning these girls names and then you're all of a sudden thrown into a game. It can be a lot at one time. So I can see how the spring coming up would give you so much more time to prepare and um, do all that. So I want to kind of shift gears. Um, I want to talk name, image, and likeness. So IU has kind of helped lead the way into the new NIL era. The school recently announced its uh, commitment to using Open Doors, which is a company that helps professional athletes maximize their endorsement value. But IU is set to start a program that helps student athletes prepare for the coming NIL changes. Now, name, image, and likeness is kind of controversial depending on who you're talking to, but you kind of seem to be in favor of the changes that seem pretty inevitable at this point. Yeah, I am. And I think the one thing, um, let's forget about the starting quarterback or the starting power forward on the basketball team. I think one thing people don't truly understand is um, there's a lot of incredible female athletes, whether it's basketball or softball or soccer or whatever, and there's a path forward for them to really own their brand uh, and, and, and become really good in social media and have a platform um, and you know what those benefits would look like and how it works. To me, that's kind of secondary to the opportunity uh, to be able to spend time to do that. And, you know, by, by default, I'm kind of an entrepreneur. I like taking on projects and building things and building companies. And uh, so for me, we're going to spend a lot of time with the kids talking to them about whatever the next step is in their professional life, where um, they can really leverage their time at IU, learn the skills, be around some really bright people and, and hopefully find, um, you know, find a path forward to be really good in that space. Yeah. You know, it seems like people, you know, think about like design Williamson's and how much they could have benefited. Um, but they forget to think about the average student athlete and how it can benefit everyone um, as a whole. So yeah, I, I fully agree. But so you were named to the big tens, anti-hate, anti-racist coalition for IU, which was formed right after the death of George Floyd, which seeks to actively combat racism and hate and empower student athletes to use that voice that you're talking about. So in your own words, can you kind of tell me what that group is and why it's so important to you? Yeah, so uh, the commission of the Big Ten, Kevin Warren, had put together a group of people and basically invited people who were passionate about this to, um, to get together, think, share ideas, and, and really think about how to move forward, um, specifically over the last few months when things got, got super, uh, super passionate in the country. You know, I, I will say this, by default, I'm Canadian. So it's hard for me to get into politics. So I, I won't do that. Um, I, I won't touch that. But what I will say is, um, and it comes back to maybe the perspective, and I'm trying to teach my team. So we might lose a season. You know, uh, Breonna Taylor is still not with us. George Floyd's not with us. Um, so many of these sports talk about um, it's safer for our kids to be here. It's safer for our kids to be here. Well, because their hometowns and where they live with the systematic racism and the violence and, you know, they don't have access to things that a lot of these college athletes do. And so, so that's my take. I think it's just our responsibility. It's a, it's a moral obligation um, to do something about it and say something about it and be part of the solution. Um, I felt that I feel this way about a lot of things and not to go too macro with you, but you know, I've got a, I've got a youngster, I've got three young kids, one turned five today. It's, it's the same concept with Sandy Hook when those kids got killed or with Breonna Taylor, with George Floyd, it's, you know, and now with the coronavirus pandemic, it's, it just seems to me that so many people are, if it's, it's not their grandpa, it's not their uncle, it's not their brother, it's not their child. Um, and it's just a very, very limited scope where I think people who aren't directly impacted have to get off the shelf and, and get to work and get in the fight here. And, um, you know, I was lucky to grow up where I grew up. I grew up in Southwestern Ontario. So Toronto, London, Ontario, um, and it really is a very multicultural country where people learn and grow. And um, so a lot of that's in my DNA. I've been around. I've had, I've had a lot of friends for a long, long time of every single ethnicity you can imagine. Um, and I just think it's our moral obligation to do more. And, and so that's, that's why I think it's important. I don't want the Black Lives Matter movement to be um, a news cycle, just like Sandy Hook was a news cycle, just like Breonna Taylor was a news cycle. I mean, at some point, people got to draw a line in the sand and, and, and make change. Um, and that's hopefully what part of this committee uh, and this group of people is going to look to do in our space. You know what I mean? I'm a volleyball coach. I'm not a politician, but, um, but I care. And I think as long as you care and you really want to make a difference, 
um, you should be active and you should have a voice and, and try to get involved in the fight. Yeah, it, it seems like this coalition is already, you know, making tangible changes. Like you guys started the Big Ten vote, voter initiative, trying to get your student athletes to vote and use their voice. Um, so I really love that. But so kind of as you're talking about, you're from Canada. So my editor Lee told me to ask, will your beloved Toronto Maple Leafs okay. ever make the playoffs again? So much as hoist the Stanley Cup. We, we will because there's no other way to look at it, but we have to. Um, you know, my wife and I laugh. We met 15, 16 years ago, and they haven't won a playoff series since we, we <laughs> got together. So it's not entirely her fault, uh, but we're going to have that conversation maybe a little bit more more frequently. <laughs> Listen, I, here's what I want to do. I want to get to the point where Indiana Volleyball's, um, you know, I've said this before, I think we have a uh, we have a chance to be a really good program for a really long time. I want to get this fixed. I want to get rolling. I want to have a really good program. And then maybe the next chapter, I got to move back to Toronto and get involved there, man. We need to, we need to have the parade in Toronto. It's been too long. It's been 1967 was the last time. Oh God. And uh, uh, you know, I want, I can't just complain. I got to get in the fight there too. We need it. We need a cup. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I haven't had a long life, but I have been a Cubs fan my whole life. So, you know, that, that time period was yeah. tough for me too. And well, that was just won, though, 18 man. years that's of my the, life. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm won, saying. We, we, we got it. <laughs> yeah, no All way. right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm um, happy birthday to your son, uh, whose you. birthday it is today. And yeah, really love what you're doing with the program. I'm a Bloomington girl. So I'm really proud of how this program has evolved and, you know, the energy that you brought to it. Thank you so much. We're working hard. We got great kids. And, uh, you know, I just want everyone to stay safe out there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cheers.